One of my strongest memories of the Olympics is playing against Timo Boll and Jorg Roscoff, two incredible table tennis players. Obviously, Timo Boll, one of the best players in the world. Jorg uh, Roscoff was a world doubles champion and we were playing them in doubles. So, you know, it was going to be a really tough match for us. But we went out and um, onto the court and uh, they announced uh, Timo Boll and Jorg Roscoff. And of course, the Australian crowd, give them a nice little clap. And then they announced uh, myself and Brett Clark and the crowd went bananas, just so loud. And I look over and I see uh, George and Timo just giving each other a little smile saying, we're gonna teach these guys a lesson. Um, and you know, but it was just such a great experience to be playing at home in front of such a big crowd. And you know, they gave us heaps of support, didn't help us in that match, they destroyed us. But it did help us in our first match because our first match was against a Cuban pair and it was really early on the first day of the Olympics. The Cuban pair were a bit nervous. We got a, a good start and beat them, I think 21-10 in the first set. And then they calmed down a bit and they had a game point in the second set. But we managed to you know, finish off a good rally, get to 20 all and then win 22-20 um, to be the first Australian doubles pair to win a game at the Olympics. Thanks for joining us on this week's show, the theme, the Olympic Games. We'll hear some more from me about my experiences at the Sydney Olympics and also we're going to look at some old suitcases full of stuff that I've collected from the Olympics and see what's in them. Hope you enjoy the show. Stay with us. It's hard to believe that it's been 16 years since the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Uh, I've got some old stuff here that I haven't looked through for ages. I'm not even sure what it is, but I thought it'd be, you know, interesting just to take a look at it and see what it is. Here's the Australian Olympic team. It's the, um, yeah, table tennis competitor, Jeff Plum. Let's see what's in it. All right, it's the Sydney 2000 Olympic coin set, $5. Check that out. I wonder if I can cash that in, $5. Um, we don't even have a $5 coin in Australia, but there you go. I made it to the games news article. <laughs> and uh, personal management for aspiring Olympic athletes. What a document that one is. And um, yeah, some little documents on life in the Olympic Village. The Olympic Village officially opens on the 2nd of September 2000. By this time, the Australian team precinct within the Olympic Village will be set up and fully operational. So what's, uh, what's the big yellow case? The big yellow case, I can't remember exactly. We got this as well when we first got there. Let's just check out, uh, oh, here you go. This was your accreditation. You had to, had to wear that around with you everywhere. Um, and, you know, a lot of people find this a little bit silly, but it's got the, on the back of it, the Australian National Anthem, just in case people didn't know it. So um, to make sure you never were lost for words when you were singing the song. Oh, here we go. Here's the, um, the official commemorative medal. Check this one out of uh, the Olympic Games there. Wow. Lovely. Oh, and here you go. Um, this is interesting too. Uh, Jeff Plum from ASDA, the Australian Sports uh, Drug Agency. Dear Mr. Plum, I'm writing to notify you that the drug test sample 201313 you provided on the 20th of the 4th, 2000 has been analyzed and found to be negative. Yes, not a drug taker, great to hear. Boxing kangaroo flag. Everyone needs one of these. The boxing kangaroo. Oh, and does anyone wear a watch these days? Australian Olympic team watch. Ha <laughs> who doesn't want one of those? And the Aspire newsletter. Now this is kind of old fashioned. Every day at the Olympic Village, they produced their little newsletter for everyone in the team and it would just give the news about who won gold medals. None of us table tennis people, unfortunately. 
But um, yeah, um, nowadays I guess it would all be electronic, emails and stuff, old fashioned. Another one of the $5 coins, that's $10 worth I've got here, awesome. And then another great part of uh, going to the Olympics is getting free clothing. Who doesn't like free stuff? And um, I haven't opened this suitcase for a long time, but there's um, apparently a lot of clothes in here. So let's just see if the suitcase um, opens. What? Oh, yes. I've forgotten about this. This was the, um, the doona that we had at the uh, Olympic Village. And... Um, at the end, I think they said for everyone to leave the doona there, but no one left the doona, everyone took it. Shh, don't tell them um, that I've got it. Um, yeah, so that's the, uh, the doona from the Olympic Village. And then here's all the, uh, oh yeah, tracksuits. So much clothes you got. Australian uh, tracksuit. Some of them are pretty ugly. Um, this one was pretty nice though, I like that one. The, uh, the Australian logo and the, the Olympic rings. Um, and then, yeah, some of the, uh, yeah, some of the opening and closing stuff, you know, not, not the prettiest that you're going to wear anywhere else, but, you know, maybe they thought it would look good on TV. Gee, that could use an iron, couldn't it? But, you know, yellow, probably not my best colour. <laughs> and then, yeah, just more tracksuits. Oh, yeah, this was the bag we had to wear around, I think, with the, uh, at the opening ceremony. There you go. Um, well, that was to hold the pillowcase. Oh, these were the playing, the playing gear. That's the playing shirt. There we have, that's what we wore during the games. And then the shorts, some more shorts. Oh yeah, and then there was an alternate playing one as well. Here you go. Just the yellow with the Sydney 2000 and the Olympic rings and Australia on the back. And um, yeah, more shorts, and oh yeah, here we go. Check out this stuff. This was like a, um, I guess it's meant to be like the color of Ayers Rock or Uluru, as it's now known. Um, and it was, uh, look at that fancy stuff on the inside. Wow, check it out. So that was, um, yeah, with the pants. I'm not sure about those pants, but you know, maybe it looked all right on TV. And then of course, who doesn't need a nice green, suit with a coat of arms and the Olympic rings in it and then check out some of these great shoes that you get you can see these green ones here um, they're almost wearable like they look like sneakers a little bit but these white ones check out how bright they are are you really going to wear them out anywhere I think the only person that could use those is Alois when he's uh, doing a bit of disco dancing the opening ceremony is just a fantastic event to be part of. We almost weren't gonna be allowed to march in the opening ceremony because it was on a Friday night and our first match was at 9 a.m. the next morning. And the management staff were like, oh, but you know, it's gonna be a late night. You know, you're gonna be tired. You're gonna be sitting around. Are you really gonna be able to perform your best the next day? And we're kind of like, how many times are you gonna be in this position? Of course we have to march, you know, imagine the, you know, the excitement we're going to generate from that and how that's going to help us the next morning. So uh, luckily we got to march. Um, and because Australia was the host nation, Australia comes out last. So we were sitting in the um, gymnastics stadium beforehand and they sort of had the opening ceremony on the big screen, but it's hard to sort of watch it. So we missed a lot of the actual action beforehand. But then when it was time to march out, the whole team, there's like five, over 500 in the Australian Olympic team that year. Uh, went down, marched into the stadium, and you could just hear the, the crowd just roar, just the loudest thing you've ever heard as you walk in. And then you do a whole lap of the stadium and they're just roaring the whole time. We had little uh, boxing kangaroo soft toys to hand out, so we were throwing them into the crowd. Um, yeah, it certainly made us feel like celebrities. So yeah, so after the excitement of the opening ceremony, um, we had to wake up early the next day, get down for a nine o'clock match. Now it was a strange situation that year because of the, the way the teams had been selected. There was just one match to be a qualifying match to get into the main draw. So we actually had to play off against the Cuban pair to qualify for the main draw. So that was nine o'clock. If we lost that match, we were out of the Olympics. Interestingly, at the Olympics, you've got all the team gear, 
But then you've got your own table tennis bat and your own table tennis shoes. So they don't provide shoes because obviously, you know, you could wear a slightly different brand. But because of the way the Olympic works, you're not allowed to have any logos on your shoes. So you have to tape up all the brands on your shoes beforehand. The only logo that can show is your team uniform and it has to be quite small. I'm not sure of the specifics, but yeah, so everything has to be taped up. After we beat the Cubans, we had two more matches on that Saturday against Yugoslavia and Germany. So yeah, the Timo Boll, George Roscoff match. Unfortunately, we lost both of those. So that did end up putting us out of the tournament. So then we had two weeks in the Olympic Village just to watch all the other Olympic sports. So it was fantastic. We were watching uh, basketball and running, of course, lots of the table tennis. Um, swimming, Australia had a really strong swimming team at that time. Um, so it was just a fantastic, you know, to be a spectator and watch all these other brilliant athletes compete. So the table tennis that year was really interesting. Uh, Waldner was aging and um, Kong Ling Huey was in his prime. Those two met in the final. Uh, Kong Ling Huey got off to a great start, was up two sets to nil. Waldy fought back two games all. But then in the fifth game, Kong Ling Huey came out and got a really big lead um, and basically, you know, took any chance away from Waldner winning. And what really surprised me, I can't even remember the final score, but the last point, Waldner just basically gave up. He just flicked the ball into the net, went up and shook his hand. I was like, I know the chances from that far down are not much of winning, but surely you would fight it out the whole way. Um, yeah, but I guess it was only one point. And so Kong Ling Huey, Olympic champion in 2000. The best results for Australia was the women's doubles where Shirley Zhao and Miao Miao reached the quarterfinals and had quite a close match in the quarterfinals. But what a great effort. Uh, that's still the furthest that um, any Australian has progressed. Uh, brilliant effort by the girls. And, you know, hopefully one day we'll uh, get even a step further. Go Aussies. The other question I get asked about all the time is the dining hall. So they just have this big hall, like massive hall full of food, lots of choices. There's a Macca's in there, but there's also like, yeah, Chinese and Australian and all sorts of different foods. And you just go in and it's all free. They have um, ice cream stands where you can just go and get Magnums, the best ice cream, all for free. And um, yeah, especially after we'd finished competing, so we didn't have to worry about, you know, uh, proper diet. We were just eating everything and anything. It was just awesome. But then what happens is after the two weeks are up, you come out and you go back to normal life and you walk to a store and you're like, do I really have to pay for that Magnum? It's such a, such a bizarre experience. Uh, you really are just treated like a celebrity for those two weeks. Um, and then, uh, then it's back to normal life. The tip of the week this week is how to get off to a good start in a match. One important thing to consider when you are wanting to get off to a good start in a match is your routine before the match. You need to think about even the half an hour, the hour, and perhaps even the day before. What do you do that helps you to get ready to play a good match and to start well? So if you look at the best players in the world, what they will do is they will have a set routine. In that hour or two hours beforehand, they will know when they're going to eat, when they're going to be hitting, when they're going to be resting, when they're going to be sitting down, uh, listening to music perhaps, and also thinking about tactically what they are going to need to do in that match. Often when the club player goes out and plays, it's a matter of, all right, my turn to play, pick up my bat, off we go, and let's start. So really try to think now about perhaps a match that you played well in, and what did you do in that hour or two hours before you played that match? Did you eat? What types of things did you eat? Did you practice? What type of practice did you do? Did you rest? And also, when you actually get onto the table, then let's also consider what you're going to do on the table. Here's some things that I would recommend. In the 
two hours before, definitely you need to practice for at least half an hour of things that you're going to utilize in the match. Start off with some general hitting perhaps, but then we need to get much more specific. We need to make sure that you're doing some serving, some return of serve, some third ball drills, and you also need to prepare yourself physically. So um, do a good physical warm up. Do a bit of a jog around, get your heart rate up, get yourself sweating, get the, the body ready to play a, an important match. You also need to spend a bit of time thinking tactically. All right, you know who you're going to play next. What tactics do I need to employ? What types of serves do I need to do? What type of returns don't they like? Where do they like the ball coming? Where do they not like the ball coming in the rally? All of those things, if you just spend a few minutes beforehand thinking about, once you get onto the table, they're already recorded up here and they're already starting to work in your subconscious. It's not then a matter of, okay, oh, um, it's love all, where am I gonna serve to? All of that's already in there and you're much better prepared. Don't forget, there's the Ping Skills Vault where you can record all of that information so that when you work it out for this time, you've got it in the vault and ready to activate next time you play that opponent or next time you play any match. Now it's time for our two minute warm up. What I want you to do is to make sure that you're really active during that two minutes. So even when the ball goes off, you need to be active, run and go, grab the ball and come back. So that way you, you're starting to maintain your heart rate and getting the heart rate up before you play the game. So don't stand there and just do some backhands like this. As I said, be active, start to use your legs, use your counter hit, but also make sure you use your top spin strokes. And you, don't be afraid to get around and pivot on the backhand side if that's what you do in a match situation. Then we're gonna swap over. So usually do a minute on both sides. And make sure again on the forehand side that you're nice and active. Do a few counter hits, a few top spins, and also just hit a couple of balls hard. Now, the, the protocol for when you're warming up is to make sure you do hit the ball consistently um, a lot of the time, but don't be afraid to just hit one or two balls hard just to get the feel of that at the start of the match as well. So that then, when you're ready to play that game, the first point, you're active, your heart rate's up, and you're ready to go. The drill of the week this week is forehand anywhere in memory of Ru Sung Min, the 2004 Olympic champion. To build up to the drill of the week of forehand anywhere, we're just gonna build up by doing a forehand, forehand footwork drill. So that just gets you moving into those two positions and getting you active with your legs. So from that, we're then going to go anywhere. So I might um, say to Jeff that the first ball is going to go to the forehand corner, but then after that, I'm going to play the ball anywhere. Especially if you're a forehand dominant player, this is a drill that you can utilize in a training situation. Initially, you could do it fairly consistently, and then after a couple of minutes, you might want to play stronger. You can also do this drill with multi-ball. Let me tell you, that drill of the week gets you a real good workout. Remember when this week we're taking a look back at the 2004 Olympics when Ru Sing Min took out the title.
that's where he's at his best. Playing strong top spins with his forehand from all round the table. The opponent gives him half a chance, that's what he'll do. Got to keep him under pressure. Stay, just got to stay close to the table, Nick. So, today's Remember When is about Ru Sung Min. We've got some footage there from 2010, six years after he won the Olympic gold medal in Athens in 2004. Difficult to get footage of that uh, 2004 win because the IOC are really strict about their, um, their guidelines with, uh, with video, but at least we get a little bit of a chance to see Ru Sung Min playing those forehands from all over the table. And in 2004, he was in his prime. He was covering the whole table with forehands. I remember clearly that semi-final match that he played against Jan Ove Waldner. Waldner had gone through the draw and you know there was a lot of um, stuff happening around Waldy. The king of uh, Sweden had been there to watch him in his quarterfinal. The king of Sweden was there to watch his semi-final against Ru Sung Min. Ru Sung Min was just devastating. He was absolutely ripping his pendulum topspin serves. Waldy just couldn't control it, couldn't keep it down. And then that was basically game over because then that allowed Ru Sung Min in with his forehand topspin wherever the ball went and he was just devastating. That got him into the final against Wang Hao. Now, before the final, Ru Sung Min talks about he had no pressure on him because Wang Hao was the definite favourite. You know, Chinese had really dominated now for a while. Um, they were the best players in the world. Wang Li Chin had been knocked out in the semi-final by, uh, by Wang Hao. Uh, Wang Hao was in top form, but there was that little bit of a doubt. Wang Hao had failed before and would he fail again? And I think that was Ru Sung Min's little chink that he found that he could exploit. The final he went in and he knew that to win, he had to attack. He had to get out there and play a strong, aggressive game. He did that. He lost the first game, then was up three games to one, up 8-4 in the fifth game. And suddenly, the little mind started ticking. Can I be Olympic champion? And, you know, we, we feel that when we're in a club match. You know, if we're 8-4 um, up against someone that we uh, haven't beaten before or, or in a big match, our mind starts thinking, imagine the pressure on Ru Sung Min at 8-4 up in the fifth game of an Olympic final. And he admits to himself that he started to think about the finish line. He started to think about, oh, I, I could actually win a gold medal here. And what happened? He stopped playing the game that had got him to that massive lead. He stopped attacking. He allowed Wang Hao back into the match. Wang Hao took his opportunity and took that fifth game. But Ru Sung Min wasn't finished. He knew that if the game got to three all, Wang Hao would have his confidence up. So he really knuckled down. He told himself, okay, this is it. I have to employ the tactic that won me those three games. I have to utilize the tactic that wins me most of my matches. And that is get around, get my forehand in and swing hard. And that is exactly what he did in the sixth game and was able to close out the Olympic final and to take the gold medal. What, what an achievement by Ru Sung Min. Was nowhere near favorite going into the event, but was able to overcome all of that, overcome the Chinese player Wang Hao in the final. I remember seeing Ru Sung Min in the, in the village in the dining hall after the match and just the big smile on his face. He was just, he was floating on air and you know, uh, we had the opportunity to go up and congratulate him and, and uh, as, did, as did many thousands of other people. But Ru Sung Min uh, was, it was so, um, was such a, uh, soft soul as well, you know, like very, very grateful for, for congratulations. Um, he obviously didn't expect to win and to be put into that situation. Um, he was just absolutely floating on air. Ru Sung Min, 2004 Olympic gold medalist, 
great champion. There is a great video of Ru Sung Min reminiscing about his 2004 gold medal. We can't show it because of copyright, but it is well worth checking out. We'll put a link in our show notes and on the blog. So get in there, click on it and go and have a look. It's now time for the tournament wrap. Alrighty, it is time for the tournament wrap and with the Olympics only a few days away, we're taking a look back at all the past winners. Alloys, who are the winners of the Olympics? Well, yeah, so um, interestingly enough, Korea has done really well in the men's singles. In the first Olympic Games, um, Yunam Q, gold medalist, Kim Ki-tek, silver medalist, um, and in that one, Eric Lind took out the bronze medal. And uh, we featured that uh, recently in uh, one of our Remember Wins. That was, uh, yeah. That's what a, it was so amazing to see um, the forehand of Yunnan Q, just incredible. Yeah, and then in 2004, as we talked about uh, in today's show, have we done that already? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Ru Sung Min, also devastating forehand. Um, winning the gold medal in 2004 from Wang Hao with Wang Li Chin winning the bronze medal. Now, the other, the other non-Chinese male to win was, of course, the great Yan Ove Volna in 1992. So the first two Olympics, Korea, Sweden, China, didn't win their first um, Olympic men's singles until 1996 in Barcelona. And, and they didn't even get a medal in the first Olympics and uh, just got the bronze in, um, in the second Olympics in Barcelona. Yeah. And so not a great start for the men in the Olympic table tennis. No, that's right. But uh, since then, they've done pretty well. Um, Lugo Liang, 1996, uh, beat Wang Tao um, in the final uh, with Jorg Roscoff. Uh, someone we discussed earlier today, Jeffrey. Yes, played against him in 2000 in the doubles. Um, yeah, didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and then 2000, the Olympics that Jeff went to, um, men's singles, Kong Ling Hui beating Yan Ove Voldner in the final and Liu Go Liang getting the bronze medal. Um, we talked about Ru Sung Min in 2004. 2008, and 2012, very Chinese dominated. So 2008, all three men's singles medals, China. Ma Lin, gold, Wang Hao, silver, and Wang Li Chin in the bronze medal position. So clearly different rules back then. Three Chinese taking out three medals, now not possible. Yes, and after that Olympics, they changed the rules specifically to make sure that China didn't win three medals, um, and that from then on, only allowing two players from one country. Controversial, but that's how it is. Uh, so 2012, Zhang Ziqi, as we know, the current holder of the men's singles championships and the runner-up was uh, Wang Hao for the third time. Three times in a row. Like, that's a pretty impressive record to get to the final of the Olympics three times in a row. Not many people have that longevity, but not to win one. He must be so disappointed. He will be very disappointed and uh, will never win one now. Poor old Wang Hao. But, you know, I mean, if you go home to three silver medals in your cabinet, you, you haven't had a bad sort of career. Although it was interesting, uh, recently um, there was a study done a study, it's easy to throw those things out, that um, bronze medalists were more happy than silver medalists. Yes, I did see that. Um, and, and that's probably because, you know, at the final hurdle, they probably have had a win um, to win the bronze medal, whereas at the final hurdle, um, the silver medalists have had a loss. And also, I think in that study, um, they talked about the silver medalist always thinks, well, oh, I could have won the, the gold medal, but the bronze medalist is happy to have won a medal, usually. But, <laughs> yeah, 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 who interesting, knows? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So uh, we'd love to know your thoughts. Uh, jump onto the Pink Seals blog and let us know who you think is going to take gold in Rio. Yeah. And let's look back uh, also at the women's singles medalists. And here, it's just an absolute domination by China. So China have won every gold medal 
um, in the women's singles. So starting in 88, Chen Jing, 92, Deng Yaping, 96, Deng Yaping, 2000, Wang Nan, 2004, Zhang Yining, 2008, Zhang Yining, 2012, Li Jiao Jia. So, wow. Um, so interestingly there, Alois, a couple of back-to-back uh, winners, Deng Yaping and who else? Uh, Zhang Yining. Yes, yeah, Zhang Yining. Uh, in the men's, no such back-to-back winner yet. Zhang Jike, can he do it? Uh, who knows? I don't think so, but, you know, will the Chinese manufacture something for him? That would also be interesting. Um, Ooh, yeah, and conspiracy theories. <laughs> conspiracy theories. And then also, don't forget, we have had um, teams events. Uh, so uh, in 2008 in Beijing, uh, men's teams went to uh, China and in 2012 men's teams went to China. So uh, China really dominating and same with the women's. Uh, China have won both the, the women's teams events to date. So there you go. That is uh, the history of the Olympics. Um, yeah, as I said, let us know your predictions coming up and get excited. We are so close now to the Olympic Games. But Alice has a few points he wants to mention first. Yeah, we, we didn't mention that before um, 2008 there were men's doubles and that's what Jeff played in. Um, so there was men's doubles events and after that they changed it to to a teams event. So it used to be doubles, men's doubles, women's doubles. Now it's men's teams, women's teams. I think it's a better idea. And we also did talk recently about, is it worth just having teams events? Yeah, I, that's, I, I like that idea for some reason, just having the teams events. Um, it's country versus country. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then it get, gets rid of all that, um, you know, well, you're not playing singles and I'm playing singles and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. What's your thoughts? Let us know. Yeah. Should they even have singles at the Olympics? So there you go. All right. So that, that's who, it. That's all. I've, I, I, do you want me to tell you yeah, some of the who, results? Who are the okay. winners? All right. Sure. Um, well, there we go. Men's doubles. Um, so. <laughs> 88, China. 92, China. 96, China, 2000, China, 2004, China. They won every single men's doubles. Um, women's doubles, South Korea in My 1988 um, with Hyun Jung Hwa and Yang Jung Ja be, uh, beating uh, Chen Jing and Zhao Jimin in the uh, final. And in Seoul, wouldn't that have been a popular victory? Absolutely. Men's singles and the women's doubles. Whoa. Crowd was going berserkly. Well, yeah, berserkly. So, no, berserkly. No. Um, and then China have won all the other doubles, women's doubles since then. So, yep. There you yeah. go. All right, well, that's a wrap. Get excited. Make sure you're watching the Olympics table tennis. It's going to be fantastic. And uh, that's a wrap. Although that was a wrap, Alice did want to point out the total medal counts for countries, which is quite interesting. So, uh, go Alice. Okay, so total medal counts, and this is interesting. Um, So, South Korea have won 18 medals. That is huge, right? 18 medals. And the closest after that is three from North Korea, Singapore and Sweden, oh, and Germany with five, sorry, Germany have won five, but South Korea, 18, China, 47 medals at the Olympics, 47 compared to 18. That is just total domination. Well done, China. It's now time for the questions. And remember, you can ask your own table tennis questions at pingskills.com. Pranesh has asked us a question about how to implement his forehand in a match situation. He can play his forehand well in isolation, but when it comes to a match situation, he gets himself into trouble. Being able to play forehands in isolation is a good first step, but it's really important that then you transition to being able to play the forehand when you think that the ball can come anywhere on the table. A good drill to do this is to just start to play the ball anywhere 
And every now and then I can play the ball to the forehand side. So the aim here is to not know that the ball's coming to the forehand and then still be able to execute the forehand. You'll notice that Jeff isn't just going back straight to that forehand ready position and he's not turned two side on. So he's not staying in this side on position, um, just expecting the ball to come back to the forehand. What he's doing is he's playing the forehand, watching where the ball is and then reacting. So then if the ball comes back to the forehand, he's going back here. If the ball comes to the backhand, then he moves straight to this position. So you can see that it's a really different position to moving from here back to here to play your forehand as opposed to just standing side on and playing your forehand from that one position. Linz asks us the next question about how do you apply your backhand success to your forehand stroke? So what Lynn's talking about is the use of the wrist. Now on the backhand side, you're using your wrist in this motion from backwards to forwards, that sort of movement. Whereas on the forehand side, you're using your wrist in that sort of movement. So it's the sideways movement. So you can see that there's not as much movement with the forehand wrist action as there is with the backhand wrist action. The forehand then needs to rely more on your forearm and your bigger swing, as well as relaxing that wrist and allowing it to flow through uh, nice and easily to maximize that movement in the sideways motion. One thing to remember though, is that your forehand stroke still needs to remain complete. You need to finish with that bat up above your eye level. When we start to talk about the wrist and re relaxing it and moving it through, often players start to compromise and do that sort of thing. It just doesn't work effectively and efficiently. Watch the best Chinese players in the world and watch their technique. It is always there. The next question is from Eugene and he's asked us, is it important to use your waist during the service motion? Well, let's look at the master. Let's look at Ma Long and his service action. You can see here now he's set up to serve. He's playing a match against Zhu Xin. Let's have a quick look at his action. So, so he starts his motion. He's thrown the ball up. You can see that the, the waist is still in the same position. The ball's coming down, the waist still in the same position. He, is just about to contact it, still hasn't moved his waist. And now he's contacted, the waist is still in the same position. And then from there, um, he utilizes his weight, waist. You can see there though, that he's utilized his wrist. His wrist has come all the way through. His elbow is up really high and he's used his forearm to generate all of the spin. After that, he moves into position, utilizing his waist and his legs, and he's ready to play the next ball. If you're strictly thinking about the service motion, then you're not using your waist at all, because as you saw, Ma Long keeps his waist in that position. He gets the spin from the wrist and the forearm, but then he utilizes his waist and his legs to jump quickly into position to be ready for the next ball. Our next question comes from Ryan, asking about competition mindset. Ryan wants to know how to maintain his sense of zen and sanity before and during a competition. So your mindset needs to start not only on the day of your competition, but the day before or in the time leading up. You need to start to think a little bit about what you're going to do before the tournament, what you're going to do during the tournament, uh, the players that you might be playing against, so the day before, it might be thinking about uh, your food intake, what sleep you're going to be able to have the night before. And then on the day of the competition, we start to think more about, okay, how do we prepare on the day? How do we warm up? And what do we do during a match? Thinking about our uh, pre-point routine, what sort of routines that we do during the day as well. So 
that competition mindset is it's a it's a really bigger picture. It's not just about um, what's going to happen on the day. We need to start to think about that beforehand as well. During the match, you also need to think about your pre-point routines. So little things that you do in between each point that are comfortable and that you do repetitively to get you into a, a very comfortable frame of mind. At the Olympics, watch the best players playing and you will notice that they will have some little routines that they do before each point. So some might bounce the ball on the table or on the floor. Um, you'll notice a lot of the time players will go up to the net or close to the net and wipe their hand on the table. What's that? For some of them, it's just to wipe the sweat off their playing hand, but for some of them, it's just a routine. It's a thing that they do regularly before a point. The most important thing though, Ryan, is to go out there and really enjoy the day. Learn as much as you can. Learn about your own game. Learn from the other players around you and see how that can benefit your table tennis. Eugene's asked us the next question about positioning yourself at the table. Your basic stance is where you're in the ready position, you can just touch the table and where your bat's basically on the middle line there. From that position, you can reach to that forehand corner and you can also reach to the backhand corner. But in the rally, we need to always alter our position. If I hit the ball deep into the forehand corner, it'd be crazy for me to move over here because I'm just not covering the natural angle. From that position, this is the natural angle that you're going to get and I'm going to cover the area that I think that the ball is going to come to. And similarly, if I hit the ball deep into the backhand corner, now I'm going to cover this area. So, Eugene, your position then always depends on where you've hit the ball. And you need to think about covering the angles of where the ball can come to. And for our next question, we delve right back into the archives of 2012 and a question from NASCO who asked us, is Ma Long participating at the London Olympics? It's interesting to see my answer from all that time ago and how it relates to now. So in 2012, Ma Long didn't get a chance to play in the singles and played in the team's event only at the Olympics. And relating it to now, so Zhu Xin is in a similar position, not playing in the singles, only playing in the teams. But probably more interestingly, Fan Zendong not getting to play at all. So in 2020 in Tokyo, could we be talking about Fan Zendong being the favourite for the men's singles? And now it's time for Ping Skiller Mail, where we read out your feedback on last week's show. So, Alois, we had some pretty interesting comments uh, on the show last week, um, especially from VJ and Stanislav. Yes, so uh, VJ talked about uh, what an inspiration Dot Delo was, and uh, one should take a leaf out of her book. So, uh, yeah, totally agree. Uh, Certainly, yeah. Keep active to long into your old age and, yeah, what an inspiration. Absolutely. And then Stanislav had said that uh, the topic um, uh, from Johnny really hit the bullseye, he said. Yeah, so Johnny asked a question about losing to players that he thought were weaker than him. Yeah, so he said, I also feel somewhat distressed when I constantly give points, sorry, give points to weaker players. Give here actually means lose. And weaker means players who never trained a proper technique and mostly push 90% of the time. And, <laughs> and that is interesting, isn't it? Talking about weaker players, yeah. they're not really weaker. No, exactly. Different. If yeah. they're beating you, they're probably not weaker, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> Good point, Stanislav. So, um, yeah, he said he usually use, loses to them when he hasn't trained recently and start make, starts making lots of uh, serve mistakes. So... Yeah, good points from Stanislav and uh, probably something that we need to keep in mind. Yeah, well. and I think it's a good attitude he's got there about talking, he needs to relax to achieve a better performance and there's still much that he can improve in his game. So great sentiments there, Stanislav. So thank you for all your feedback. Um, as always, we love to hear from you. So leave some comments on the YouTube channel 
or on the Ping Skills blog at pingskills.com. And that wraps up today's show. Thanks everyone for watching and we will see you again next week. Make sure you enjoy the Olympic Games. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bye for now. We love talking about table tennis, so if you've got a table tennis question, head over to pingskills.com and use the Ask the Coach section of the website. We'd love to hear from you. The music for today's show was Far Away by MK2 from the YouTube Audio Library. I asked Alois what he felt at his recent disco competition and he said he didn't feel too good about it and... I also feel somewhat distressed. Oh, I could have won the, the gold medal. Thanks so much for watching the show. We'll be back again next week with another episode. Until then, keep enjoying your table tennis.